second week of this mini course on discrete probability models. We talked last week about different models for uh, for connect connectivity or different random graph models, maybe still <coughs> relatively far from real world networks. We considered connectivity and the giant component of these models. This week we'll be focused on on geometric models. And the first part will be to finish what I, what I couldn't finish last time, namely to show a tool how to show sharp concentration in a, of the existence of a giant in a, in a geometric model. Let me just recall the, the OSSS inequality that I mentioned. And then we will show how, how it can be used in the very simple model of, of bond percolation on Z2, as I mentioned. Although, I'm, although the, we will present it here only in, in, for bond percolation on Z2, it, it can and was applied for, for other geometric graph models as well, in particular if, if the long range dependence is not too, too big. Okay, so what was this? The setup I mentioned that already last time, but let me just recall what I did on, on Friday. So if we have an increasing Boolean function from 0, 1 to the n to 0, 1 increasing, and we have an algorithm t, which I mentioned exactly what, was, what that meant, an algorithm t, Well, then we, the OSSS inequality says that, and flip each, well, let me say that, flip each bit of the input omega, which is the input vector here, to be one with probability p, and zero with probability one minus p, independently, and then we have that the variance for, for a fixed p, the variance of this Boolean function is bounded by p times 1 minus p times the sum over all n delta i t times the probability that the ith bit is pivotal for, for f, <coughs> meaning that the ith bit really makes a flip of the i-th bit from 0 to 1 really makes the function to change from 0 to 1. And delta i of t was the, the probability that there exists one moment before the stopping time of the algorithm, which depends on a given configuration omega. So that's the input. And we want to reveal the, the value of the function with few bits. So delta i of t is the probability that there exists one bit such that the, this bit, the, the revealed bit at time t is equal to i. And we said that we want to, we want to bound the revealment of this so that we get, so that if we, if we have a low revealment for each, for each bit, well then we get that here that the i bit the probability that the ith bit is pivotal, or rather the sum of these ith, or rather the sum of these probabilities, if we are able to bound this uniformly and take it out of the sum, well then we get a then we get a lower bound for the sum of the probabilities that the ith bit is pivotal. So then you know by Rousseau's formula that the derivative of a function with respect to p is relatively large. And if a derivative of a Boolean function with respect to the, to the parameter p is large, that means that there is a sharp threshold going on. That means that within a small window, the value of the function changes, <coughs> changes rapidly. OK, and we will apply this OSSS inequality for, for bond percolation on Z2, as I as I mentioned on Friday. So we, we will 
our function f will be the function delta n, which is the probability that in z2, 0 connects to the boundary of the, of the n by n square. So here is 0. That's the n by n square, so z2 restricted to a, to a box n by n, which of course is a, um, an increasing event because if I'm adding edges and I have already a connected graph, then, or if, I have, if I'm adding edges and I have already a, a path from 0 to the boundary, then by adding edges the, the path will, will still exist. So that's increasing. And uh, the event, well, that's for, for a given p. Maybe let me, let me write it here like this. For a given p, so that depends, of course, on the parameter p, that each bit, each edge in this case flipped is indeed 1. So the probability to, to connect to the boundary depends on p. And in percolation models in an infinite setup, you typically are interested in PC, which is the smallest P, such that the probability that 0 connects to infinity is strictly positive. Right? That's, the, that's the main parameter that people in, in the infinite setup look at, but you can Think of a finitized version for n large enough as a model of a, of a, of a geometric graph. And, uh, well, it's, of course, uh, the first question of interest for, for any percolation model is to, to find the value of PC, which is well known to be, in, in, in the case of bond percolation, to be one half. I will, I will not... I will not prove that, but PC on bond percolation on Z2 is one half. And then, of course, you can, you can ask further questions whether, for example, what happens right at the threshold for criticality. So it's known that for, for two dimensions, the probability to have an, a component or to have a path from zero to infinity is exactly zero. It's conjectured that this is the case for all dimensions, but it's only known for high enough dimension where certain tools, which are so-called lace expansion, work to show that PC at, at, the, at P equals PC for higher dimension, you have uh, this probability being zero. But for, for dimensions three, four, five, this is, this is not known. Conjectured to be true, but not known. And then you have then you can ask, for example, other questions, whether, whether the, in, the sub, in the supercritical case where there is a positive probability that zero connects to the, to the origin, to the, to the boundary, whether this, this component is unique, which turns out to be the case. There's in the, in, in, in the case of, of bond percolation, which turns out to be the case in many other models, but not in all. So there, for example, hyperbolic models where, where, this, where you have an infinite number of infinite components. But for graphs where the boundary, like in this setup, where the boundary in a measure theoretic sense with respect to the whole set of points is small, you typically have a, you typically have a unique infinite component. Or in the case of a finite setup, you can then adapt this to show that there will be a unique giant component. You know, if, it, if you have a sort of hyperbolic setup which corresponds to more like a tree shape, then the boundary, like in a tree, the leaves are a constant fraction of, of all vertices. If that happens, that the boundary is important, then you can imagine that you have maybe several infinite paths going out. And then there might, depending on the model, there might be, for example, two different thresholds, one for having some, an infinite number of, of infinite components, and then another uniqueness threshold for, such that after that you have only one giant component. Okay. But the goal of this, of this lecture today is not to show this, 
but it's rather to show how to use the, the OSS-S inequality to, to give a theorem which was, which was known for the case of bond percolation since the early 80s from Menshikov, but the advantage of this OSS-S inequality is that it's more robust in the sense that it works even if, the, if there is more dependence between parameters, which is not the case here. So the theorem is the sharp threshold phenomenon or for, for PC, Z2. Namely, the theorem says that for all P less than PC, um, the probability that zero connects to the boundary of the n by n square centered at zero, this one here, decays exponentially fast. And uh, for all, and also there exists a C, which is not the same, for some, for some C here, there exists a C such that the probability that zero connects to infinity is at least some constant times p minus pc for all p larger than pc. Okay, that was a threshold known to, due to Menshikov for, for Z2 in the, in the early 80s, and then, then Duminil Copain and others came up with a proof using sort of um, a sort of Rousseau's inequality, uh, Rousseau's formula. But then there was another a third proof, which is this one, which has the advantage to be, to be more flexible. Okay, so what's the, the first, the main lemma that we will prove? Well, the main lemma will be to find an algorithm T such that the revealment of each bit here, of this algorithm T, will be low. Okay, so the, lemma, the main lemma that, that, is a, that we'll prove today is that for any n, if we sum over all edges in the n by n square, the probability that the edge E is pivotal for the event that zero connects to the boundary of the n by n box is at least n over Sn, theta n times 1 minus theta n, where Sn is the, th the sum of theta k up to n minus 1. So theta n is the probability that you, that you connect, that 0 connects to the, to the boundary of the n by n square. So here you have the, the sums of connection probabilities to the, to the 1 by 1 square, to the 2 by 2 boundary, to the n minus 1, and so on. And you can see that this is, this is something that, well, that will follow from this, from this inequality. So when I'm, because here all, your, all our bits here, Okay, all our bits here will correspond to edges. So the, the, n, the n bits here correspond to, to not this, the, this n is not the same as, as this n here. So here we, ha we will have the number of edges. Each edge will, will correspond to a bit. And, if, and how, how, can we, how can we hope for, for getting this lemma one? Well, if we're able to find an algorithm such that this here is uniformly bounded for each edge, well then, as a function of this, putting it to the other side, we will, we will get this desired formula. Right? Because the, the first thing that we can observe is that if, if f, in our case, corresponds to the limit um, of this theta n, so we have a, then the, the variance of, of, a, of, a, of a Bernoulli is just theta n times 1 minus theta n. Okay, so let me, let, let me go into, 
into the details of this proof. How do we show that? Well, we have to find an algorithm. This works for every algorithm, and we have to find a clever re revealment strategy. So we have to find an algorithm, an algorithm revealing each bit with low probability, revealing each edge in this case. with small probability, because that means that we have a lower bound on this, and we might be able to, to take this out of the sum, and then we just have the sum of these pivotal probabilities here. And what is the strategy? Well, I mentioned it last time briefly. The strategy is not to do breadth first search start not to do breadth first search starting at the origin because that would mean too much, too high revealment probability for, for these edges, not to start at the, at the boundary either, but rather to start at the random location. So this is lambda k. And do the revealment both towards the inside and towards the outside from that, from that part because once we know once we know that there exists, or rather just observing that there exists a path from zero to the boundary, if and only if there exists a path that, that crosses this, this boundary, right? So if we know, if we have, for example, explored all those points on the boundary and we cannot continue anymore and we don't find a path from zero to, to lambda n after having explore, explored or ha after having revealed all this, then we know that there is no such path. So we fix some k, and then we'll average, we'll average over all k. So fix some k between 1 and n. And how do we reveal? Well, we set, we'll, we'll set up a certain, not breadth first, not, not depth first search, but, a, but an algorithm that starts with the vertices that are on the boundary of lambda k. So these are my first vertices that belong to, to my, that I want to check. Okay. And we'll gradually increase those sets to be always always be the vertices that are connected to the to the previous set so in particular to the boundary of 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 uh, lambda k to be the vertices connected to the boundary of lambda k and the exposed edges will keep track of edges as well. So the exposed edges initially will be, will be the empty set. And then we'll, we'll keep on exposing until at some point we, we, can't, we, we, can't, we don't get new information anymore. And the algorithm is just the following, knowing at, at step t, knowing, knowing vt and et, so these are the vertices that, that are restricted to this n by n box, so knowing vt and et, call this F0 maybe. Well then just do the following and do the following. So if there exists one edge, an edge between 
x, y in Z2, which we haven't checked yet. In Z2 it exists. We don't know if it exists after, after percolation, which is not among the edges explored yet. So this is, let's call this the final set En. But it's not among the edges that I checked yet. So it's an edge that I, I haven't explored yet. But there is x in Vt and y is not. So x is among the vertices that are connected so far. So far, y is not connected. Then, OK, if there are several ones, then, then take the smallest one. And if there exists such an edge, well, then let's reveal this edge. So then set the revealment bit at time t plus 1. This i t plus 1 is the bit revealed at time t plus 1 to be that particular edge. Add this to the, to the set of edges expo explored so far. And the set of vertices, well, it will be adapted depending on, depending on the, the fact whether or not the edge percolated. So we set Vt to be either Vt plus this vertex y if the bit was 1, so if the we was 1 and, and 0 otherwise, and, and it stays the same otherwise. Yeah. So this is just, we're, we're, we're standing at some, at, some, at some point here. And there is, for example, this edge of Z2, that's one edge of Z2 re restricted to this n by n box that we check. And if this edge is really there after percolation, then this, then this belongs to the same, then this, this will be absorbed into the set of vertices checked. Okay? And as I said, if there are several ones, then, then pick the one with smallest index. So suppose there's some labeling on the, on the edges so that this is deterministically defined. And if no such edge exists, well then, then we can just arbitrate also if two, if no such edge exists, then we cannot find new things anymore. No such E exists. Then we set the the t plus first bit to be revealed to be e, where e is just the smallest index. This is a bit arbitrary. Here is just the smallest, uh, the smallest e inside the non-explored sets, in non-explored edges, and, and adapt. So here we are not. We're not adding anything anymore. Okay, this is just for, for, for defining the algorithm. Okay, so once we are, once we are in, the, in this case two, then, then we always stay in this case two, and then nothing happens anymore. The, the exploration of the component happens only as long as we're in, in case one, right? So in case one means a kind of as long as there are some edges belonging to Z2 which we haven't checked yet, well then we go inside, outside, inside, outside, with the hope that at some point, for example, we find a path, and then, then we, we, could, we can stop, or that all of those edges kind of are isolated or isolating zero from the boundary, and then we, we can stop as well. So in particular, the stopping time of this algorithm, not in the sense of martingales, as I said, but rather in the sense that the algorithm ends at this point. We just observe that the stopping time of the algorithm is smaller or equal than the last time we're in the first case. It, it can be, so that means that the stopping, the, the, the point where the algorithm ends, remember that we said the algorithm ends when 
we already have enough information to determine the, the value of f, or in this case, theta of n, meaning that we don't have to continue exploring anymore. So it could, for example, happen that, that we already find a path from zero to the boundary, but there is still a, an edge here that is not explored. So it, it, could, it, it could happen early. It could be that the stopping time is really strictly smaller than the last time we were in the first case, but definitely by the time we, we exit the first case and we, we enter the second case, we can never enter the, the first case again, and uh, by that time definitely the, the algorithm had stopped. So in particular for, so in particular for an edge UV, for an edge UV, the revealment probability of that edge with the, using this, this algorithm T, which is this algorithm there, I mean that's the probability that there exists some time before the stopping time such that the teeth bit revealed is equal to that edge. Well, that therefore can be bounded from above by the probability that either u is connected to the boundary of lambda k and by union bound v as well. Because that's the that's the end of, of case one. In case one, we have all information. We have the information when we exit case one, we know whether a certain vertex will eventually connect to that via path of edges to the boundary of lambda k or not. And that's, the, that's this, this case. So the, the stopping time is, is definitely earlier. Namely, it could happen that zero is disconnected or that we already have a path uh, connecting zero to, to the end, to, to the boundary of the box, okay? And then we just observe that if we sum up over all k, which we'll, we'll use because this k will be uniformly chosen so we can think about it as averaging over, <coughs> over all such k. Observe that when I'm summing up over all k for a fixed vertex v, the probability that the vertex connects to the boundary of lambda k. Now this is something like here we have my zero here. Here's a vertex v. So here's lambda k. Well, the, the vertex could be inside or it could be outside of this of this of this, of this k by, uh, of, this, of this box of, of radius k. But what's the probability that v connects to the, to the boundary of, of lambda k? Well, we can at, at say that for, for some k, it's at least the probability that v connects to the boundary of a box which is at least a certain distance away from k, namely at least the distance from, from v, that v is from the origin. Yeah, so this is kind of centering, recentering. We put now the, the here we have at this distance, and we start at, at this point here, and this distance that is that is remaining here is at least this k minus this distance here. Okay, so it's, for, this is, it, as I said, it, it could be inside or outside, but in any case, this is the distance that, that v has to walk towards the boundary, so to say, the number of edges that have to be revealed in here is at least the distance from zero to the boundary, which is k, minus, minus the, the distance from zero to v. Okay. And since we sum up over all k for each vertex, well, for each vertex we say, okay, we have to, 
we have to recenter that at that vertex and we sum up over all, over all possible numbers here, the distance from V to zero, and we defined Sn to be the sum of delta k here, then just observe that when summing over all k, I'm summing, so here's my vertex v, summing over all k, I'm basically summing over all possible distances. Yeah, something like this. I'm recentering at, at v, get 1, 2, 3, and so on, plus a, fac a factor 2 because it can be both inside and outside. So in particular, this here is at most twice the sum of Sn. Okay? So this means this is one Sn is for those that are inside this box because you fix a vertex and you make larger and larger boxes around this vertex at most until n. The same thing around from the outside, we could be outside and you again sort of recenter and the distances are at most, the distances to the box, to the boundary of box one, two, it, it, at most until n. Yeah. So because, well, you can also think it out this way that each, each box is sort of, if you prefer to think about it in this way, so if you fix a box here and you, and you fix this boundary, then basically this boundary is counted twice. So you, you can also think about it in this way, from both inside and outside. Okay. So then you can sum and, and average over all k. This was so far for a, uh, this was just the sum here. But if we, if we sum and summing and averaging over all k, and averaging, or sum, it was already sum, so let's say just averaging over all k, meaning that we choose those, this k with probability 1 over n, any number between 1 and n, we get that for that particular edge, the revealment probability is 1 over n, for the probability that we start at a given k times the sum that either u is, so e was uv to re recap, that, v, that u is connected to the boundary of lambda k and v is connected to the boundary of lambda k. Each of them is just 2Sn, so this is here is at most 4Sn over n. Okay. So then we can use this OSSS inequality, which says that the variance of, the, of delta n, which, re, which I remember was the, the probability that, that you're indeed connecting to the or rather they indicate the event of the, of the, of the variance of this event, so the, of, of f, which is the indicator event that zero connects to the boundary. If you take an indicator event, well, the indicator event of, of that event here is just the probability of this times one minus this, that's a, that's a one zero random variable, which is Bernoulli, and, and it has this, this variance. By the OSSS inequality, well, this is bounded by a buff from P times one minus P we had, and then we had the sum over all, over all um, revealment probabilities, but note that Observe that this, this bound here does not depend on E. So we have this, this uniform bound independent of E. So we can plug it up. We can, we can take it out of the sum. And we just have here the probability that E pivotal for, 
for the connection probability towards the, towards the boundary. Pivotal for the event that zero connects indeed to the boundary. And we are done. Right? We have exactly that. This sum here is, uh, is at most this because we, can, we may upper bound P times 1 minus P4 by, by 1, right? So let me, let me write it maybe to, to, to have it explicitly here. That, that proves this lemma. Okay. So this lemma shows that we, we can get a lower bound on the probability that, that the sum of on the, pro, on the sum of the probabilities that edges are pivotal <coughs> using a relatively good algorithm. There's nothing special here in the, case, in the case that this has to be bond percolation. So this could have been random geometric graphs. You could have imagined that if we have the, our Poisson point process of points, we could have started somewhere and then explored those balls little by little. You can do similar things for other models, such as when you have certain long range edges as well. So for example, random geometric graphs with edges going further away, you can do it you can do it for, for vacant percolation as well. So there's, there's lots of robustness in this model. And the main advantage with respect to previous tools is that here you don't have to worry so much about, say, positive or negative dependence. Because it could be, for example, that if, if I'm looking at certain balls around the point, well, then maybe the, you explore this area and, and the, this hurts you in the sense that some some area is already explored and you're less likely to find a point there. That's the, 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 the main, or one of the main advantages of this, which, which, which made it useful in, in other contexts where, where, where the application of, or where the existence of a sharp threshold was not, was not known before. Okay. So that's the, the revealment part. Okay, that, that shows this lemma. And how can we use this lemma now? OK, so there is another lemma which I will not mention, namely this, which I will not prove, which is Rousseau's formula. Which tells us the following, if we have if we have, let f, say, be, an, be the indicator function of an increasing event A, increasing event A, so think about this just as the, the connectivity event here, namely the connectivity to be connected to the, to the boundary where in the, we are still in, in the case of bond percolation in where each, each bit of the input is, is one with probability P and zero with probability one minus P. Well, then the derivative of F with respect to P <coughs> is exactly the sum over all edges of the probability that the edge is pivotal for the event A. Yeah. That's, the, that's the, main, uh, the main tool that I will not prove now. But it's not, not, the proof is not particularly hard, I would say, but it's rather technical. But the intuition should be, 
should be relatively clear. The intuition is that if there are many edges, so let me just make a picture. Proof. That's not a proof. That's just a, a sketch here. So if there are many edges that are pivotal, for if I have, for example, my origin here, and I have certain path going out of, of this here, then, well, there might be some edges, like those one in purple, that are critical for, for the event that zero is connected to the, to the boundary. It could also be somewhere in the middle, for example, this one. Right. All these edges are, are pivotal for the event that zero connects to the boundary. Yeah. The expectation of F, or? Uh, the expectation of F, here, you mean? Here. Thanks. Um, yes, sure. OK, more questions? Um, yeah, so what, what did I want to say? So here, the, the intuition is the following. If there are many critical edges for the increasing event, so many edges that are pivotal, like all these purple edges here, then a small change in the probability of all these bits might have a big impact. Namely, if they, even though P changes just by a little bit, if there are so many edges here that, that have a chance to be, to be influential, well, then even a small change of the probability will make one of those bits flip from 0 to 1. And then it is, it is reasonable to say, OK, in a very small interval of, of p, the value of, of having or not having a com connection com to, the, to the boundary changes rapidly. Right? So if you have many edges, or in, 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 that case, in, in that case, all edges are, are 0, 1 with probability p, but that's more general. If you have the sum here high, then a very small a small change of the probability already makes a drastic, drastic difference for the fact whether or not you get connect, you're connected to the boundary or not. Okay, so this this Russo's formula is something that you kind of have to reprove if you if you're in a different setup. This is this was known and is known for 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 bond percolation for for a while. But you can usually adapt it for, for different, uh, different tools, set for different models as well. OK? Without proof, this. If you, if you want to find a proof of this, for example, uh, Hugo Dominique Copin has lecture notes on percolation theory. And uh, by the way, this, this proof is. Is, uh, is also from, from Hugo de Minilcopa. I should, I should mention that. It's lecture notes on statistical physics. That's where this, this is coming from. OK. So that's the, the first part. Then the second part is another, another lemma. Which says the following, if you have f n, a converging sequence of differentiable functions that go from 0 to x0 to 0 and m, there are a, a sequence of a converging sequence. So think about this just as our, our indicator function of, of, of the connection probability, a converging sequence 
towards some limit theta, which is in our case this theta infinity, sequence of differentiable functions increasing in x they are bounded by m by some constant m so we have some we have some functions that that the larger the input the larger the value but the the value of m the, the value of f is is bounded by m and suppose that the following holds namely that the derivative of fn is at least n over sn fn where sn is the sum of fi as before they indicate the functions to connect to the boundary of of the i by i i by i box summed until n minus 1 you see why n minus 1 not not i so that, it, that that this holds for all n suppose that this holds for all n well then there exists some x1 in the interval 0 x0 such that two things happen namely one for x smaller than x1 There exists some C, well, depending on X, but positive, such that Fn of X is exponentially small. For, for all N large, say. And two for any X larger or equal than X1. This limit which exists by by assumption satisfies that f is at least c times x minus x1 for some absolute c for some c positive. That's actually a lemma that is uh, not, not related to any random graph model. This is just a, a way how to, to show this exponential decrease. So for our case, for our setup, this Fn will, will be the indicator function of, of connecting towards the, the boundary and that will be just theta infinity the limit of this theta n that just the probability that, that zero connects to infinity and it says exactly what the what we want namely that we have exponential decrease below this certain number here and that for every number above x1 we are by a linear fraction away from it so if 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 at PC we're at least say 0 0.5, or, which is not true, but if we if we, if that were the case, then then the then the, at a larger value, then we're at least by a factor that is linear in the difference from PC away from away from the the fr from zero. Yeah, so x1, think about x1 as PC, the critical probability, Fn as as the indicator for for connecting to the to the boundary and uh, and we have this this lemma which is analysis which is calculus by the way by the way so let, let's prove it because it's still is kind of interesting in a sense that you you prove it in 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 two steps so what will be x1 
Well, x1 will be the smallest x. such that the limb soup of log Sn over x divided by log n is at least 1. <coughs> okay, so that's kind of the, the candidate for, for, for having uh, the threshold at this point. You, you'll see from, from, from the proof where why this is defined in this way. Mm. Well, okay, let's prove the first part. Assume first that x is smaller than x1. Take uh, some delta positive, x prime, x minus delta, and x double prime, x minus 2 delta. And we will show that at x double prime, we already have the desired exponential decay. So we'll show exponential decay in two steps. Okay, so first by definition of x1, by definition, since this is the was defined on this way, in this way, well, there exists some n, and an alpha positive, such that for an x that is smaller than x1, well, this is not true. So Sn of x is smaller than n to the 1 minus alpha, for all n larger than this capital N. Okay. So it's if it, if if x one is the the point where you have the first point where you have the smallest point where where S n is basically n, then for an x smaller than x one, since this this, this is a limb soup. From some point on, from some large n onwards, as n of x will be, will be really smaller than n, right? In the sense that in the exponent you gain, you gain some alpha. Okay. Well then, for such n, what do we know? Um, by assumption, fn prime is at least n over sn fn. So since sn is n to the minus alpha already for that x, so also since, since that's increasing also for, for smaller ones, fn prime is at least n to the alpha fn. I'm ignoring kind of the argument here since, let, let me say that this follows from monotonicity. For all, for all x, for all values, between x prime and x, by monotonicity. So this, if this holds, at x, and x prime is even smaller. So here we have x, is x1, here's x prime, and here's x double prime. Here as n of x is smaller than n to the one minus alpha, then here also, here also smaller. Because f, which is as n is just the sum over f's, and, and f was supposed to be increasing by hypothesis. Okay, then, then we just observe that this holds. We have fn prime, so the derivative without all this interval, without along, sorry, not without, along this interval here is not too small. So meaning you should 
you can integrate. So integrating this This value, this function here, which, which depend on, on, on some z. I should maybe write it once. Between x prime and x. Okay, that, that, will, that will give us some result, not yet the full result. Well, first of all, what is this, the integral? Well, I guess all of you can do that, right? If I'm integrating f prime of x over f of x, this is the log of the absolute value of f of x plus some constant. You can, you can check this. So then in particular, here, what, is, what do we get here? Well, that's um, the log of um, fn of x prime minus the log of fn of x, uh, or the opposite rather, x, x prime. By assumption, this is at least n to the alpha times some delta. So this is at least delta n to the alpha. And expo taking exponentials, we see then see that fn of x over fn x prime is at least yeah, exponential of delta n to the alpha. So in particular, at x prime, so at x prime, we already have that this is at most fn over fn of x times maybe some, something like this. Which is not yet exactly what we want, because alpha, because alpha is not 1. We have not shown exponential decay at this point. But we can re repeat this argument, since in particular, well, this, is, this was at most m, right? So this is at most m. This is at x prime, the value is already much smaller. So we can repeat the argument. So we repeat the argument for a second interval. For a second interval. We know now by this assumption, by this calculation, right, that Sn of x prime, the sum of these. Well, that's, that's a converging sum. So that's, a, that's something that says bounded by s for all n. And we can repeat again and say, OK, so we know that fn prime is at most, well, this by assumption, we had this. fn for all values between x prime and x double prime for all values between x double prime and x prime. So now in, we have improved our original setup. Instead of having this, <coughs> instead of having fn prime, yeah, instead of what we had from here, instead of having fn prime at least n to the alpha fn. We now have fn prime being at least n fn. You can do exactly the same thing what we did here. And then this alpha becomes a 1 here. Okay. So then we get that fn uh, at x double prime is really exponentially small. So this, this shows that by, by taking this, this delta to be as small as possible, you have the desired, desired um, exponential decay for x, 
smaller than x1. And for the second part, for the second part, take now x larger than x1 and define for n larger than 1 tn now you see why 1 over log n with the sum of fi over i differentiate with respect to x So we get that Tn prime with respect to x we differentiate, so that's still 1 over log n. Here we get a sum of Fi prime divided by i. Fi prime by assumption was at least this number here. So this is at least 1 over log n uh, times sum of fi over si by assumption. And I'm claiming that this is, well, this is some calculation, is at least log of sn plus 1 minus log of S1 divided by log N, where I'm just using that 1 plus X is small than e to the X. So this follows. Where star follows. using that fi over si. There was a reason that this was defined until i minus 1, because now this is si plus 1 minus si over si. And this, by this 1 plus x less than e to, e to the x, is at least this one. OK, this is an a calculation that is not too difficult. Okay, and then using this part, we get that for for x prime in between x one and x using that this Sn is increasing. Is increasing. We integrate again. Integrating again between those numbers between x and x prime, we get that this Tn, well, it's a bit uh, it's just this number here, Sn plus 1, S, S1 is at most m, so this is well, I have to put here x prime formally, divided by log n. Okay, so if you believe me this, then you see as n tends to infinity, um, Tn <coughs> tends to f of x, where f is the limit of this Fn, if you make uh, Fn large, well, this Tn 
converges to F. And so in particular, Fn, F of X minus F of X prime is in the limit at least x minus x prime times this limit, say this lim soup here, which is bounded by 1. So and then you choose x prime or x prime to be converging down to x1. So f of x is larger than x minus x1. This was maybe a bit fast, but this is a technical part. It has nothing to do with, with random geometric graphs. It's, this was just a way how to, show, how to show, on the one hand, exponential decay, and on the other hand, to show that shear by a linear fraction away from the, uh, from the critical value. Okay? This was, as I said, a, a technical lemma, but now lemma 1 and lemma 2 together with Rousseau's formula will allow us to, to show easily the, the sharp threshold phenomenon. And that's, uh, that will then conclude the, the proof of this theorem. Proving the, the theorem of the sharp de decay. Well, first of all, recall from the revealment algorithm that we had a bound on the, on the, let me write that down. We had, by lemma one, we had that the sum over probability that E is pivotal for uh, the, uh, the event that zero connects to the boundary, we said that this was at least uh, n over Sn times theta n, one minus theta n. And by Rousseau's formula, and Rousseau's formula, This sum here is exactly equal to, to delta n prime. Right? This was the expected value, the difference of the expected value differentiated is the difference in the probability. And now we just take some p0 between PC and 1 and observe that for P smaller than P0, on the one hand, 1 minus theta n of P, well, that is uh, monotone in P, so theta n of P decrease, increases if in P, so in particular, 1 minus theta n is larger than 1 minus theta n of p0. And on the other hand, it's also larger than 1 minus theta 1 of p0, because it's easier to connect to the, to the just to a 1 by 1 box. And since p0 was larger than pc, this number is, is, uh, is positive. So we then set Fn to be this 1 over 1 minus theta 1 of P0 times theta n in that formula. And we can check, and we check that the derivative of Fn prime, which is just this derivative here, 
satisfies what we need for, for lemma two. Okay, maybe I will not. Okay, I will, I will maybe not do this. So this is to be checked, but an easy calculation up to n minus 1. So we can apply, so we can apply lemma 2. And lemma 2 says there exists some, some value x1, which will be PC tilde. So by lemma 2, we get that there exists some PC tilde in this interval 0, P0, such that there something happens, namely that this happens. There exists some sharp decay below the threshold. And above, it's a uniformly bounded away from that. number. So this the lemma does not tell you that this PC tilde is exactly the same PC that you have from the from the Bernoulli's from the from the definition, but it must be. Because if if it were different, for example, if PC tilde for example were strictly larger than PC, well then you could not have an exponential decay of this probability because you know already that there is at least uh, some positive probability at that point. So, and similarly, PC tilde cannot be smaller than PC as well. But we must have, by the, we must have that PC tilde equals PC and the theorem follows. So this, this was a, maybe a bit fast towards the end where the part is more calculation, but hopefully not so fast and clearer towards the beginning where there is the, the idea of the, of the low revealment. But the point I wanted to make that this is a, a tool that is known for 20 years in, in communication complexity, but only rather Seven years ago, or maybe by now ten, this was this was used for showing for showing a sharp threshold in in in, in particular in, in in geometric models. Okay, and the advantage, although that proof was that particular proof was known for for this simple model of bond percolation already much before. The advantage is that this, this works for different models as well. So advantage of this proof, advantage of this proof, of this proof, works for different um, random geometric models as well models as well. So in particular, it works, for example, for, for Voronoi percolation, which I will not explain, but Voronoi percolation is a, is a way of tessellating the, the plane such that you, that each, each point of, of, a, of the plane is associated to exactly one cell, unless it's on the boundary. And imagine the, the, the cell gets colored, is colored with, 
black with probability p, then to show that for such a model you have, a, you have also a sharp threshold, you can do this model. You can do it also, for example, for, for a vacant set percolation. Maybe in the remaining five minutes I can, I can, and so on. So for models that are more, in, more interesting from an application point of view, or for Boolean percolation, which is basically random geometric graphs, but with, with a bit longer edges, so this is RGG with potentially longer edges. But there is still some gap in the sense that these edges cannot not be as long as, as you want. But for example, for certain, for certain power law degree distributions for the, for the, for the, for the radii, radii around each ball, you can do that. So just a short comment. So what is vacant set percolation? So what is, it's still not a so, so interesting model from the point of view of random networks, but it's an interesting model on its own. So what is that? So you, your points are Z2 and setup is the following. So for every vertex of Z2, Zd, say even in general, with probability one minus p, not p, but here one minus p, you put a ball of radius r, put ball br of radius capital R around x, let's say a squared ball for simplicity, and that will be an occupied set. Okay, so let's say a square ball. And you do that for it, each x, and it, at the end you don't look at the occupied set, but you look at the complement of this, which will be the vacant set. So, for example, here is my, here is z2. Here are the points somewhere. For each vertex, you, you put a ball of the radius, say, fixed in this model. Say, for example, for this x here, you put this ball here. Could be radius like this, for example. And then you put another one for this, for example, like this. this. So this will be occupied. This will also be occupied. And at the end, look at the complement. At the end, at the end, look at the complement of all occupied balls. So we have a vacant set, which is the vertices that are not in any of those purple balls. So the set of vertices which are not in any ball. the so-called vacant set, which is increasing in P, and that's usually what in vacant set percolation you, you look at. That's why you put here 1 minus P, because the more, you, you, the more, the more your balls eat up, the, the, the smaller the, the vacant set. And the question you can ask is whether there is a giant component in the vacant set. Question is, is there a giant component or an infinite component in the infinite setup? Is there an infinite component in the vacant set in W or in omega? And this works. This was not known before because if you if you think about it, in, 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 if, you, if you want to do a classical exploration, the fact that, for example, some, some 
balls are already explored. This tells you that these vertices here are already occupied. So there is some dependence. But the OSS inequality works in exactly the same way for showing, for showing sharp th threshold also in this, in this case. Yeah. So for the OSS inequality works in, well, in exactly, in almost exactly the same way in this setup. You just have to find a sort of clever revealment algorithm, which is basically the same. You, you, you don't, I'm not telling you where, where, where to start exactly, but at a randomized position. The OSS inequality starts to become a bit more complicated once you allow edges that, that, that do this, like in certain Boolean, Boolean percolation models or in, or in Voronoi percolation models, where in principle, the color of a cell might depend on someone that is very far away. But if these effects are somehow, somehow rare, in the sense that it's relatively unlikely to have a very large region, such that one, something that happens here has an influence for something that happens very far away, then this, this still works. So in particular, if if you have an exponentially low probability that, that two points at distance t are such that the color of, of that point or the existence of an edge emanating from there affects what is, what is going on there, if that probability is low, then this is still a, is still a very good tool. OK, that's what I wanted to, to say today. One more lecture, so that lecture will be on, a, on another technique that is very useful in, random geome in, in geometric random graph models, so-called renormalization. So I will, I will explain that in, an, in, other, in another context where there might be edges of, of longer distances. Okay, questions?